Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to scale large language models. Uh, LLMs have become a part of our lives now and with, you know, amazing models like ChatGPT, GPT-4, you know, solving incredible number of tasks coming from like summarization, QA, um, you know, mathematics, and just, you know, assigning facts, writing poetry, writing code, and a bunch of really amazing things. And while these models are like, you know, super incredible, it's not always clear like how to build such models. And in this video, I'm going to be really going through the process of how do you take some data, how do you take some model and create something, you know, as powerful as like a model like GPT-4, basically, right? That's um, the focus of this video. And uh, in order to do this, you know, there are a number of different factors that needs to be considered in terms of how we choose the model, how we curate the data, and how we scale all these things. And that I'm going to be talking about them shortly. But before then, uh, I'm going to explain a bit, you know, what large language models are. At this point, uh, everyone is sort of like used to, you know, large language models interacting with them on a daily basis through various applications like either Bing Chat or ChatGPT or, you know, similar apps. And fundamentally, a, mach a large language model is a machine learning model that's you know, typically a transformer that has the ability to understand and generate text, you know, just like a human can. And this is really important because in order to give us all those like, you know, amazing responses, like, you know, writing correct code or writing very good poetry, the model needs to understand text, right? Like it needs to understand our intent, it needs to understand our words relate to each other. Uh, you know, we need to understand things like humor and various things. And it is this understanding to then decide, you know, on how to respond to us. And the way these models are trained is quite simple. So basically we have like a bunch of text that's been like sourced from the uh, internet or from vendors or wherever. And they typically like, you know, billions or even trillions of words. And what we just do is we have the model look at these words and try to predict the next word. For example, given a sentence like, you know, winter is coming, uh, what we then do is we pass winter is into the GPT model and our expectation is that it should predict coming. Now, if the GPT model predicts something like winter is man, then we know like that's incorrect and we penalize the model for that and it trades on it until it gets it correctly. And in order to do this rather simple task, the model needs to, you know, develop like a model, a, a world model, an internal world model of text of, you know, various human interactions. And by so doing, it learns mathematics, it learns poetry, it learns code, it learns all sorts of super complex things, you know, given the scale of the data is a training. So it's, the training itself is just like next word prediction, but through this process, the model develops very complicated and complex capabilities. And with training it this way, uh, there are different dimensions that we need to consider when, you know, training a model. First, the model needs to be big. Everybody sort of knows now that, you know, large language models are large. In fact, it's in the name. And they need to be like billions or maybe at its very extremes, trillions of parameters. Um, and also the data needs to be like really big, typically trillions of tokens. And finally, the diversity and quality of the data is really, really important. And in this video, we're going to talk about how all of these things, you know, can be scaled, you know, uh, what is the most important thing here and, you know, how to combine, you know, big models, big data and, you know, data quality to like create super amazing models. Hopefully, you know, can combine all of this in the right way to create models as good as like GPT-4. The first dimension is really model size. And we're going to uh, l understand this via the lens of the evolution of GPT models, starting from GPT-1. GPT-1 was introduced by OpenAI in 2018. In fact, the term GPT didn't exist before uh, GPT-1. Uh, it meant generative pre-trained transformers. And this was a groundbreaking paper. Uh, the model at that point contained 170 million parameters. Uh, interestingly, 170 million parameters was quite huge for that time because models weren't typically that large. And it used a decoder-only transformer uh, architecture. And the primary goal of it was, you know, to 
for transfer learning. So you would like do this next word prediction on any bunch of text and then fine tune it on specific tasks like oh the GPT one model you know was like fine tuned on tasks like summarization or fine tuned for tasks like sentiment analysis rather than you know doing zero shot inference the way we use them today. So this was a very good paper back then. Uh, and this was followed up by by GPT-2, which would contain 1.5 billion parameters. Now, this was like really large and quite a breakthrough at its time. Uh, in fact, if you look at this graph on the right, you could see GPT-1 on one side and GPT-2 on the other side. And GPT-1 is really small compared to GPT-2. And this was the first model to generate like really coherent text, right? That could generate text that you feel like, oh, this text is like really nice and, you know, quite coherent. And it was also the first GPT model to be able to perform like zero shot inference, which is like without particularly fine tuning it on any specific task, you could prompt it uh, to like solve a task. This was quite interesting and was followed up by GPT-3. GPT-3, as you can see in the graph on the right, is like considerably bigger than GPT-1 and GPT-2. Uh, it contained 175 billion parameters, which is a massive scale up from 1.5 billion. And it was the first model that was really able to generate human like text that you know, was super impressive. Uh, besides being able to generate text that looked like it was written by a human, the model performed really great as zero shots uh, 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 task like, you know, the language translation without being explicitly trained for language translation or the logic reasoning writing poetry that was like really cool, uh, doing QA uh, writing code that could actually execute. This is just like, you know, a few t tasks. And of course, today we use GPTs for like a whole range of these tasks, but GPT-3 was really the groundbreaking work that enabled many of this to be uh, real. And so this was followed up, of course, with models like GPT-4, you know, that's like even so much more powerful than GPT-3, but uh, you can see how the model size and scale very nicely and how the capabilities emerge as the model size scales up. The next thing is like data size. Data size matters a lot. And the bigger the data typically, the better the model. If you think about GPT-1, GPT-1 was, was trained on just like 7,000 books uh, from this from a data set called the Book Corpus data set. And this is like really small compared to like the kind of data size that we used to train models today. And uh, GPT-2 was trained on millions of web pages called web text. Uh, it was quite huge, but still, you know, not, uh, not as huge as the kind of data we use today. Much of that data came from like blogs and, you know, different parts of the internet. So that was scraped into a data set called web text. Uh, GPT-3 on the other hand, was like really massive. Uh, it was trained on 300 billion tokens, which, you know, were sampled from Common Crawl, which is a data set of over 1 trillion tokens. And uh, so think about it that way. We, GP3 is like 175 billion parameters and it's trained on 300 billion tokens. So both the scale of the model and the scale of the data was like really huge. And yeah, while well, this, you know, enabled the creation of something like GP3, uh, the creation of models like ChatGPT required rethinking about you know data quality because up until gp3 the main focus had been scaling by model size and scaling by a data set size and you know not enough thinking had gone into how the data should be structured or you know what the data quality should be so this brings us to perhaps the single most important uh, dimension of scaling which is data quality and it's that data quality that has enabled this world revolution in terms of large language models being used every day for like tasks that we typically wouldn't use them for before. ChatGPT was a groundbreaking innovation and perhaps the greatest advance in the field of artificial intelligence ever. And it was trained on thousands of high quality human generated questions and responses. So think about it this way. Previously, uh, GPT models were trained on like data curated from the you know, wide internet yeah, without you know any specific structure or format to it. And yeah, some of that data is like not super clean. And it happens that for ChatGPT, you know, what OpenAI did, it was really you know, have contractors create like lots of high quality human you know, generated questions and responses, uh, 
which was like formatted in a specific way that denotes, oh, this is a question, uh, this is, you know, a system message, this is like, you know, a response. And this is like really cool. And uh, it just basically like, oh, take the GP3 model that is trained on like, you no know, noisy web data and then fight with more this really high quality one generated data. And that's enabled, you know, the first uh, uh, very cool GPT demos that, um, you know, previous uh, that the world got to know. And, you know, if you think about it going further, uh, the whole concept of scaling data quality has been really pushed further. Uh, we think about models like 5.1.5, which, you know, was released from Microsoft Research. It's a rather small model with 1.5 billion parameters, and it was trained from scratch on just 30 billion tokens. This is like so much smaller because models like Llama are trained on like about, uh, going to like about two trillion tokens and they it's it's before you know it was just not really feasible to think that just 30 billion tokens could be enough to train a, a really good model from scratch but 5.1.5 is like a really excellent model that outperforms much larger models and so strain from scratch and just 30 billion tokens that was generated from 3.5 and this kind of represents just how important data quality is that even when the model size is small, when the uh, data set size is small, if the quality is like really good, then that is sufficient to actually train like really, really accurate models. It, and you know, if you compare 5.1.5 to like the GPT-3 uh, before that was like 1.5 billion parameters, 5.1.5 is like way, way better. And think about models like Llama. Llama uh, comes in various in variants like 7 billion, 13 billion, and 70 billion. Uh, they are, you know, really excellent models from Meta AI that has helped push the frontier of open source uh, large language models. And they perform a lot better than the original 1.5 billion parameter GP3 model, primarily because they were trained on much larger data and better quality data, right? So that's kind of shows again how, you know, the data quality is like so important. Of course, Mistral 7 billion is a model from like Mistral AI that's like been really, really cool. And it's a platform like, you know, models like two times larger than it. And while there isn't much details, you know, about Mistral, uh, uh, kittens like, you know, good data is obviously like the difference here because, you know, even given like different models, there are so many 7 billion parameter models, but Mistral 7 billion stands out very different despite having like similar architecture to like other some billion parameter models. Main difference being like the data used to train it. And th this brings us to, you know, a couple of rules about, you know, scaling large language models. The first thing is like, given a fixed data sets, bigger models, we always have to from smaller ones. And that's quite true. Irrespective of quality, uh, given like similar quality, similar size, if you train like a larger model, like a larger model, we do better than a smaller one. Um, now, that's been said, the biggest accuracy improvements is going to really come from improving the scale and quality of your data rather than increasing the model size. So if you 2x your model size, uh, versus 2x the data size and data quality, uh, the improvements, you know, in data quality and data size, we always lead to like much better results than just like increasing your model size. And one general rule is, you know, always fix your data before, you know, going to like, uh, try to make changes to your model. Basically, model architecture doesn't really make that much of a difference, especially given like sufficient training epochs. Uh, what really matters the most is like data quality needs to be like really, really good. And you know, what you want obviously is large model, very good quality, large data. This brings us finally to like, you know, a procedure for building LLMs. Um, the first thing you need to do is generate high quality data using a combination of like maybe synthetic data, human annotations and verification by humans or maybe verification by much larger models. Uh, it's a good thing to spend like 90% of your time on data quality. Like if you can curate the best, most quality data, you know, you're going to get a really good model. And that's really the difference between, uh, you know, bad models and good models. Um, 
The second thing is once you have like a procedure for generating like really good quality data, scale is to be like really, really large. Like you, if you have like 1.5 billion high quality tokens, it's great. But if you have 10 billion of those, it's a lot better. Uh, but doing that without, you know, losing the quality is the key. And when experimenting, start with a smaller model. You could start with something like a sound being a parameter model to get like a base performance of, you know, on your data. And once you see like, oh, you get like good results, you could then, you know, scale this up to like 70 billion or even a trillion of parameters. So you want to get good quality data, scale it to be really large, and then train like really large models on it. And if you com can combine all this, you're going to build models that is as good as like GPT-4. So this is the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's really an exciting time for, you know, building LLMs and it, you can think about them as we are building brains for uh, super intelligence. Um, so if you, I'm going to be doing more videos like this uh, on, you know, different aspects of like training large language models, uh, some of this is going to be like code and some of this is going to be just, you know, in a bunch of like topics uh, related to the use of LLMs, deployment of them, etc. And yeah, kindly subscribe to this channel and watch out for more awesome content to come. Thank you.